We are glad to have you back on the God's Light channel. In an era marked by unprecedented turmoil and uncertainty, a breathtaking spectacle has captivated the nation, igniting fervent debate and deep reflection across the vast expanse of American skies. Ethereal beings shimmering with divine luminescence have made their presence known leaving millions awestruck and pondering the profound implications of this celestial phenomenon. Are these angelic apparitions a harbinger of divine intervention, a call to spiritual awakening, or a forewarning of apocalyptic events foretold in ancient scriptures? As we stand on the precipice of a new epoch, this extraordinary occurrence compels us to confront age-old questions of faith, destiny, and the ultimate fate of humanity. Join us as we delve into the mysterious descent of angels upon American skies, exploring the signs, the prophecies, and, and the profound significance of this heavenly visitation. The end, it seems, may indeed be nigh. Let's take a trip to this country and see what is happening. An angel with a distinctly human shape soared through the sky, its radiant wings outstretched and catching the golden light of the setting sun. Each feather shimmered with an ethereal glow a spectrum of colors dancing with every beat. The clouds parted around it forming a soft billowing path as it glided effortlessly across the heavens. Below the earth lay bathed in a warm, tranquil hue, the landscapes blending into a serene tapestry of greens and blues. As it ascended higher, the vast expanse of the sky seemed to embrace it, the infinite azure stretching endlessly, dotted with stars just beginning to twinkle. Its presence exuded a sense of peace and divinity. Celestial guardian watching over the world from above, people who witnessed it, celestial flight looked up in awe, their hearts filled with a mix of wonder and reverence. Many whispered among themselves, pondering if this miraculous sight was a sign from God. The angel's serene expression and the divine aura that surrounded it seemed to convey a message of hope and protection, as if it were a heavenly emissary sent to remind humanity of a higher power watching over them. Angels play a multifaceted and profound role in the Bible, acting as messengers, warriors, protectors, and servants of God. Their presence and actions are pivotal in both the Old and New Testaments, revealing their integral part in the divine narrative and God's interaction with humanity. From Genesis to Revelation, angels are depicted as supernatural beings endowed with immense power and responsibility, bridging the gap between the divine and the mortal realms. In the Old Testament, angels frequently appear as messengers, delivering God's commands and revelations to His chosen people. One of the earliest references to an angel occurs in Genesis 16, where the angel of the Lord finds Hagar in the desert and instructs her to return to Sarai promising that her descendants will be numerous. This encounter not only shows the angel's role as a divine messenger, but also highlights their compassion and concern for individuals in distress. Another significant instance is the visitation of three angels to Abraham in Genesis 18, where they announce the forthcoming birth of Isaac and the impending judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah. This dual role of bringing good news and forewarning of judgment illustrates the angels' function as executors of God's will. Angels are also depicted as fierce warriors in the Bible, defending God's people and executing His judgments. In Exodus 12, the angel of death passes through Egypt, striking down the firstborn of the Egyptians while sparing the Israelites who marked their doors with lamb's blood. This act of divine retribution underscores the angel's role in administering God's justice. Similarly, in Exodus 13, in 2 Kings 19, 35, an angel of the Lord decimates the Assyrian army, saving Jerusalem from destruction. These examples demonstrate the immense power wielded by angels and their ability to alter the course of human history through divine intervention. Protection and guidance are other essential roles of angels as seen throughout the scriptures. In Psalm 91, 11, 12, it is written, For he will command his angels concerning you, to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. This promise of angelic protection is a recurring theme, providing comfort and assurance of God's care. The story of Daniel in the lion's den, Daniel 6, offers a dramatic portrayal of angelic guardianship. When Daniel is thrown into the den for praying to God, an angel shuts the mouths of the lions, preserving his life. 
This miraculous intervention highlights the protective role angels play, often unseen but profoundly impactful. The New Testament continues to emphasize the crucial role of angels, particularly in relation to the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. Angels announce his birth to Mary, Luke 126, 38, and to the shepherds, Luke 2, 8, 14, heralding the arrival of the Messiah, their joyous proclamation. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men, encapsulates their role as bearers of divine messages and harbingers of God's salvific plan. Angels ministered to Jesus after his temptation in the wilderness, Matthew 4, 11, and strengthened him in the Garden of Gethsemane before his arrest, Luke 22, 43. These instances show angels providing support and encouragement to Jesus, underscoring their role as servants and aides to the Son of God. Angels are also involved in the resurrection and ascension of Jesus, key events in Christian theology. At the tomb, an angel rolls away the stone and announces to the women that Jesus has risen. Matthew 2, 8 7 This pivotal moment in the Gospel narrative is marked by angelic presence, signifying the divine power and authority behind the resurrection. And similarly, at the ascension, two angels appear to the disciples, assuring them that Jesus will return in the same manner. This assurance not only comforts the disciples, but also underscores the eschatological role of angels in God's plan for the future. In the book of Revelation, angels are depicted in apocalyptic visions, playing critical roles in the unfolding of end-time events. They sound the seven trumpets, pour out the seven bowls of wrath, and engage in cosmic battles against the forces of evil. These dramatic and often terrifying depictions of angels reveal their function as agents of God's final judgment and redemption. The angelic proclamation in Revelation 14, Doctrine 6, Doctrine 7, Fear God and give Him glory, because the hour of His judgment has come, emphasizes their role in heralding the ultimate fulfillment of God's sovereign plan. Moreover, the hierarchical structure of angels, including archangels like Michael and Gabriel, points to a well-organized divine order. Michael, often depicted as a warrior angel, leads the heavenly hosts against the dragon in Revelation 12, 7-9, symbolizing the ultimate victory of good over evil. Gabriel, known for his role in delivering important messages, appears to Daniel, Zechariah, and Mary, providing clarity and guidance about God's unfolding plan. Angels also serve as models of worship and obedience, offering continual praise to God. In Isaiah 6, 1, 3, seraphim surround God's throne, proclaiming, Holy, 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 O's the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. This depiction of celestial worship highlights the angels' role in glorifying God, setting an example for humanity to emulate in their own worship practices. The diverse roles of angels in the Bible messengers, warriors, protectors, servants, and worshipers illustrate their integral place in the divine economy. They function as intermediaries between God and humanity, executing His will with power and precision. Their presence in both the mundane and the miraculous aspects of the biblical narrative underscores their importance in the unfolding of God's plan for salvation and judgment. Whether delivering a message of hope, protecting the faithful, or administering divine justice, angels are portrayed as faithful servants of God, reflecting His glory and advancing His purposes throughout the biblical story. Angels are personal spiritual beings who have intelligence, emotions, and will. This is true of both the good and evil angels. Angels possess intelligence, show emotion, and exercise will. Angels are spirit beings without true physical bodies. Although they do not have physical bodies, they are still personalities and occasionally take on physical bodies. Because they are created beings, their knowledge is limited. This means they do not know all things as God does. They do seem to have greater knowledge than humans, however, which may be due to three things. First, angels were created as an order of creatures higher than humans. Therefore, they innately possess greater knowledge. Second, the angels know what God's Word says. Third, angels gain knowledge through long observation of human activities. Unlike humans, angels do not have to study the past, they have experienced it. Therefore, they know how others have acted and reacted in situations and can predict with a greater degree of accuracy how we may act in similar circumstances. Though they have wills, angels, like all creatures, are subject to the will of God. 
Good angels are sent by God to help believers. They praise God. They worship God. They rejoice in what God does. They serve God. They appear before God. They are instruments of God's judgments. They bring answers to prayer. They aid in winning people to Christ. They observe Christian order, work, and suffering. They encourage in times of danger. They care for the righteous at the time of death. Angels are an entirely different order of being than humans. Human beings do not become angels after they die. Angels will never become and never were human beings. God created the angels just as he created humanity. The Bible nowhere states that angels are created in the image and likeness of God as humans are. Angels are spiritual beings that can, to a certain degree, take on physical form. And humans are primarily physical beings, but with a spiritual aspect. The greatest thing we can learn from the holy angels is their instant, unquestioning obedience to God's commands. But angels do many things. All that angels do is in reference to God and according to His will. The good angels worship and serve God, while also having a role in the world that the Lord created. There are different types of angels with unique roles, archangels, cherubim, and seraphim, for example. In the Bible, Michael the archangel is listed as being the chief of angels and seems to have a special role regarding Israel. In addition, the other named angel in scripture, Gabriel, was tasked with delivering important messages to Daniel, Zechariah, and Mary. Some angels will have specific tasks in the future, such as the seven angels in charge of sounding the seven trumpets during the tribulation. The Bible tells us that angels worship the Lord and offer praises to Him. Thousands upon thousands of angels worship the Lord, bringing Him glory. At certain times, God calls angels to present themselves before Him. Angels also serve God and carry out His commands. Some of these commands include being sent by God to answer prayer and serve and protect believers. At times God can use angels as instruments of judgment on unbelieving and rebellious people and nations. Everything that angels do is in accordance with the will of God. Scripture indicates that angels observe Christians and their lives. Angels cannot experience salvation, and they are interested in the conversion experience of individuals and the application of God's grace. Salvation through Jesus' death and resurrection is such an amazing event that angels desire to investigate the preaching of the gospel. It is also wonderful that even the angels are eagerly watching these things happen. Angels have delivered messages to humans that have provided guidance and encouragement. Angels are ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation, Hebrews 1, 14. At the end of a believer's life, angels provide care at the time of death. Scripture shows angels involved in battles in the spiritual realm. We may be unaware of the angelic battles, but they do happen. Angels also are a part of new epochs of history. Angels were present when the earth was created, giving praise to God. At the giving of the law to Moses, angels were present and had a part in it. At the first coming of Jesus into the world, angels announced his birth. At the rapture, the archangel, presumably Michael, will be present and call out. And during the tribulation, Jesus' return, the millennial kingdom and the eternal state, angels will have plenty to do, issuing punishment from God, binding Satan, and measuring the new Jerusalem. Christians can learn much from the example of angels about obeying the Lord and praising His name. Truly, we can add our praises with the angels' worship and say with the psalmist, Let every living creature praise the Lord, shout praises to the Lord. Psalm 156 EEV How many angels are there? Only three angels are identified by name in the Bible. Gabriel, Michael the Archangel, and Lucifer the Fallen Angel, yet angelic beings are mentioned at least 273 times in 34 books of the Bible. While we don't know exactly how many angels there are, we do know from Scripture that an exceedingly large number of angels exist. The book of Hebrews describes a multitude of angels in heaven that are too great to count. You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to countless thousands of angels in a joyful gathering, Hebrews 12, 22 NLT. Other Bible translations use terms like innumerable, myriads, and thousands upon thousands to quantify this enormous throng of angels. The impressive picture expands in the book of Revelation.
Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousand times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. Revelation 5. Eleven other Bible versions use myriads of myriads and even millions here to express how many angels there are in heaven. While the Bible leaves the precise number of angels unspecified, some believe there could be as many angels in existence as the total number of humans in all of history. This theory is based on Matthew 1 8, 10. Beware that you don't look down on any of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven their angels are always in the presence of my heavenly Father. The passage seems to suggest that individual people, or at least children, have guardian angels to protect them. It's possible, though, that Jesus was speaking here only in general terms regarding the function of angels as protectors of children. In any case, Scripture is clear that angels do guard and protect human beings. The Bible describes different classifications of angels. Some angels, the cherubim and seraphim, are described as winged creatures. Cherubim primarily attend the throne of God as guards. While it seems the seraphim attend his throne by offering worship and praise, the Bible speaks of angels of light and fallen angels. It, angels perform different tasks in the Bible. Some angels are God's messengers. Other angels are servants of God. Watcher angels are mentioned in the book of Daniel. Angels are often described as military hosts of the celestial armies. At other times angels are called sons of the mighty or sons of God. A few passages of scripture describe angels as stars. The idea of stars may give us our best clue as to how many angels there are. If angels are like the stars in heaven, they are too many to count. Moses says in Deuteronomy 33, 2, that the Lord came to speak to him from Sinai with myriads of holy ones or angels. How many are myriads? The primary definition of myriad as an adjective is innumerable or countless. Psalm 6, 8, 17 says, The angels of God number tens of thousands, thousands, and thousands. Clearly, the writer has trouble even coming close to estimating the number of angels in existence. Angels will be eyewitnesses to Christ's return. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Matthew 2, 5, 31, the Bible says that one day the angels are going to witness Christ's return for His people. In Matthew 2, 5, 31, the Lord predicted that the angels would not only be witnesses, but they would actually be participants in Christ's return. He said, when, when the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. The angels will not only see, but they will also participate in the event that is the heart cry of every true believer, the return of Jesus Christ. So, where are the angels right now and what are they doing? In Revelation 5, the answer to that question is clear. Right now, the angels are encircling the throne where the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, is seated. And they are crying out with praise. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. 512. Where are the angels? They are in heaven. What are they doing? They are worshiping Jesus Christ. They are adoring Him. They are submitting to Him. He is the epicenter of their affection and their attention. Now here is a simple question for us to consider. Who has a better grasp of the way things really are? The angels in heaven or EUS? Who really understands reality? James 4. 14 says that you and I are like vapors. We appear for a little while on this earth and then poof, we vanish. And yet you and I, if we are honest, tend to live our lives as if this world is all that there is. And for the few years that God gives us here on the earth, what do we spend our time doing? We worship our jobs, we worship our money, we worship our relationships, our families, we worship our pleasures, we worship the things of this world. But think about the angels, they see things as they really are. They have seen the whole story of Jesus Christ from beginning to end. And what is their response? They fall down and worship Christ. He is the center of their lives. He is the center of their affection and attention. Right now, the angels are worshiping Christ just as we should be. How do we worship Christ? How do we make Him the center of our lives? We worship Him by receiving rather than rejecting the gift of salvation that He came to provide. We worship Him by saying no to those temptations that constantly assault us. 
We worship him by bringing to him, not token gifts, but our very best gifts through the church for which he died. We worship him by saying, not my will, but yours be done. O come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. All the angels are coming with him. It has been thrilling to me to read again in Matthew the sequence of events and sayings in Jesus' final days on earth. Two back-to-back -back sayings of the Lord stunned me a few days ago. Sometimes familiar things become fresh and powerful by being seen in a new relationship. At the end of Matthew 25, there is the parable of the sheep and the goats. Picture Jesus, who looked as ordinary as any other man, beginning this parable with these astonishing words, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and he will place the sheep at his right hand, but the goats at the left. Then the king will say, verses 31, 33, let these words sink in. First, let's nail down who the Son of Man is. There is no doubt. In Matthew 16, 13, Jesus had said, who do men say that the Son of Man is? And then two verses later he said, but who do you say that I am? There it is. Jesus is the Son of Man. It was one of his favorite titles. There was hidden in it the mystery of his humanness and his heavenly dignity, because in Daniel 7, 1 3 14, one like a Son of Man in heaven was to receive an eternal kingdom from God. Now let it sink in what Jesus said about himself in Matthew 25 31 33. He will come someday in glory. This glory is not the mere glory of a sunset or the Grand Canyon or the Hale-Bopp Comet or the universe. This is the glory of God as Matthew 16, 27 says, the glory of his Father. If the creation has glory that stops our mouths with its waterfalls and ravines and snow-capped Rockies and star-sheeted night skies, then the glory of the one who conceived and created it all will put it all in the shade. Does the Son of Man is coming with that glory and all the angels with him, all of them. Did you get that? Heaven will be left empty of its armies. All the angels will be with him. This means that the triumph is so sure that one doesn't have to cover his rear guard. No one will threaten heaven. All the armies of God on the front line with the Son of Man. Jesus could handle the conquest of earth alone. He is God, but the angels come to magnify him and do his bidding. What is that bidding? Just this, he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds. They are going to gather you and me to meet the Son of Man. Then he will sit on his glorious throne. He is on a throne because he is king. Then the king will say, Jesus is king of the universe now. He rules all and upholds all. Matthew 2, 8, 18, Colossians 1, 17. But when he comes, this kingship will be plain to everyone in Minneapolis before him will be gathered all the nations. Jesus, the Son of Man, the King of the universe, will sit on his throne, and every person and every president and chief and prime minister and premier and king on earth will gather and say, Jesus is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. When the elect are gathered, and the king sits in glorious judgment, then will be fulfilled the words of the prophet, Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Isaiah 63 then suddenly after this parable I read in the next verses, when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to his disciples, You know that after two days the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Same Son of Man, delivered up and crucified. Did you ever wonder what joy and hope sustained Jesus in those horrific hours of suffering? He is risen and he is coming. In the meantime, let us go forth to him outside the camp and bear the abuse he endured. Hebrews 1, 3, 13. How many angels will be with Jesus Christ when he returns? While the exact number is unknown to us, the Bible still provides you as clues as to how many angels will accompany the Lord Jesus Christ at his second coming. Deuteronomy 332. And he said, The Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of saints from his right hand went a fiery law for them. Jude 14 to 15, and Enoch also the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all, 
and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. At minimum, ten thousands is twenty thousand or ten thousand times two. To aid our comprehension, God the Holy Spirit in his written word groups these angelic soldiers into multiples of ten, triple zero. Just how high that number goes, though, is anyone's guess. For example, there could be millions of angels in the army that Jesus Christ will lead at his second coming. Whatever the exact number, these are the armies of heaven of Revelation 19, 14. Also pertinent to our study is Psalm 68, 17. The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them as in Sinai. In the holy place, there are at least 20,000 chariots of God, which would indicate there are at least 20,000 angels to drive those chariots. And just remember, one angel slew 185,000 Assyrian soldiers in a single night. You will notice that we answered the question as related to the second coming. Now we will reply to it concerning Christ's coming for us at the rapture. Only one angel is said to be present at the rapture, and he is an archangel or head angel. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore comfort one another with these words. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 18 Angels protect us from spiritual danger. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Ephesians 6, 12, not only do angels protect us from physical harm, but the Bible also says that God uses angels to protect us from spiritual harm. Ephesians 6, 12 reminds us that everyone is involved in a life or death struggle, but it is not against other people or against our circumstances. We think our biggest struggle in life is against other people. We say, if only that person would get out of my life. Or we think our adversity comes from circumstances. Oh, if only my circumstances had turned out differently. Ephesians 6. 12 says we battle not against flesh and blood, but our battle is against the unseen spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. It, there is a cosmic battle going on for your soul right now. I do not begin to understand it, but the Bible says just as angels are real, so are demons. Demons are the tools Satan uses to carry out his evil purpose for our lives. Demons are fallen angels, and like the angels, they have tremendous power. And I believe much of what happens to Christians today can only be understood through the oppression of demons. I think Satan uses demons to discourage you us, to depress us, to tempt us, and to bring all kinds of evil into our lives. Yet God says he sends his angels to do spiritual battle for us in ways we never see. Where do I find that in the Bible? In Daniel 10, 2-14, there is a fascinating story about Daniel praying to God for three weeks during which Daniel felt no answer to his prayer. Finally, at the end of the third week, an angel came to Daniel and said, I have come to answer your prayer. The angel explained that he was sent by God the first day of Daniel's prayer, but he was hindered from coming earlier by a demon. Finally, Michael the archangel had to come and free him so that he could come and answer Daniel's prayer. Now, I do not begin to understand what all of that means, but this passage of Scripture tells us there is a great cosmic battle going on in the heavenlies right now. This cosmic battle would terrify you as if it were not for the reality and the presence of angels. It, the Bible says God uses His angels to protect us not only from physical harm, but also from spiritual harm. It, how do guardian angels protect people? In this fallen world that's full of danger, everyone must deal with hazards such as illness and injuries. God sometimes chooses to allow people to suffer the consequences of sin in the world, if doing so will fulfill good purposes in their lives. But God often does send guardian angels to protect people in danger. Whenever doing so won't interfere with either human free will or God's purposes. Some major religious texts say that guardian angels wait for God's commands to go on missions to protect people. The Torah and the Bible declare in Psalm 9:111 that God will command His angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways.
The Quran says that for each person there are angels in succession before and behind him. They guard him by command of Allah God. Quran 1311 It may be possible to invite guardian angels into your life through prayer whenever you're facing a dangerous situation. The Torah and the Bible describe an angel telling the prophet Daniel that God decided to send him to visit Daniel after hearing and considering Daniel's prayers. In Daniel 1012, the angel tells Daniel, Do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard and I have come in response to them. The key to receiving help from guardian angels is to ask for it writes Doreen Virtue in her book, My Guardian Angel. True Stories of Angelic Encounters from Woman's World Magazine Readers Because we have free will, we must request help from God and the angels before they can intervene. It doesn't matter how we ask for their aid. Whether as a prayer, a plea, an affirmation, a letter, a song, a demand, or even as worries, what matters is that we ask. Guardian angels are always working behind the scenes in your life to protect you from evil. They may engage in spiritual warfare with fallen angels who intend to harm you, working to prevent evil plans from becoming reality in your life. When doing so, guardian angels may work under the supervision of archangels Michael and Barakiel. Exodus chapter 23 of the Torah and the Bible shows an example of a guardian angel protecting people spiritually. In verse 20, God tells the Hebrew people, See, I am sending an angel ahead of you to guard you along the way and to bring you to the place I have prepared. God goes on to say in Exodus 23, 21, 26, that if the Hebrew people follow the angel's guidance to refuse to worship pagan gods and to demolish pagan people's sacred stones, God will bless the Hebrews who are faithful to him and the guardian angel he has appointed to protect them from spiritual defilement. Guardian angels also work to protect you from physical danger, if doing so would help accomplish God's purposes for your life. The Torah and the Bible record in Daniel chapter 6 that an angel shut the mouths of the lions that would otherwise have maimed or killed the prophet Daniel, who had been wrongly thrown into a lion's den. It's another dramatic rescue by a guardian angel occurs in Acts chapter 12 of the Bible when the Apostle Peter, who had been wrongly imprisoned, is awakened in his cell by an angel who causes the chains to fall off Peter's wrists and leads him out of the prison to freedom. Many people believe that guardian angels are especially close to children. Since children don't know as much as adults do about how to protect themselves from dangerous situations, so they naturally need more help from guardians. A famous passage in the Bible about children's guardian angels is Matthew 18, 10, in which Jesus Christ tells his disciples, See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. The question of whether angles are inherently good or bad is deeply rooted in theological, cultural, and literary traditions, and it invites a nuanced exploration of their roles and characteristics as depicted across various belief systems. Predominantly, angels are considered embodiments of goodness, serving as divine messengers, protectors, and warriors on behalf of a higher power. However, the existence of fallen angels and the complexities surrounding their actions introduce a layer of ambiguity to the traditionally positive perception of these celestial beings. In many religious traditions, particularly within Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, angels are portrayed as fundamentally good, created by God to fulfill specific roles and duties that align with divine will. In the Bible, for instance, angels are frequently depicted as messengers of God bringing important revelations to key figures. The angel Gabriel, a central figure in both the Old and New Testaments, delivers messages of great significance such as the announcements of the births of John the Baptist and Jesus Christ. This role underscores the benevolent nature of angels acting as conduits for God's communication with humanity, guiding, warning, and offering comfort. Moreover, angels often act as protectors and guardians. The concept of guardian angels assigned to watch over and protect individuals is a comforting belief in many religious traditions. In Psalm 91, double 112, it is written, For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone.
This portrayal of angels as protectors emphasizes their role in ensuring the safety and well-being of humans. Further solidifying their image as benevolent beings, angels also function as warriors battling evil forces on behalf of God. In the book of Revelation, the archangel Michael leads the heavenly army against the dragon and his angels, symbolizing the ultimate triumph of good over evil. This depiction reinforces the perception of angels as righteous and valiant beings, dedicated to the service of good and the eradication of evil. The notion of angels as warriors highlights their active participation in the cosmic struggle between good and evil, demonstrating their commitment to upholding divine justice and order. Despite these predominantly positive depictions, the existence of fallen angels introduces a significant complexity to the characterization of angels. The most well-known fallen angel is Lucifer, whose rebellion against God and subsequent fall from grace transformed him into Satan. This narrative, found in various theological interpretations and apocryphal texts, suggests that angels, like humans, possess free will and the capacity to choose between good and evil. Lucifer's fall is often interpreted as a cautionary tale about pride and disobedience, illustrating that even beings created with the intention of serving good can succumb to negative impulses and become agents of evil. The concept of fallen angels extends beyond Lucifer, encompassing a group of angels who followed him in his rebellion. These fallen angels, now considered demons, are often depicted as malevolent forces working against God's plan and humanity's well-being. In the Christian New Testament, these demonic beings are frequently shown as antagonists to Jesus and his followers, causing suffering and leading people astray. This duality within the angelic realm, where some angels remain steadfast in their goodness while others fall into corruption, complicates the simplistic dichotomy of angels as purely good or bad. In literature and popular culture, angels are often moral complexities, reflecting the multifaceted nature of their roles. Works such as John Milton's Paradise Lost explore the internal conflicts and motivations of angels, particularly those who fall from grace. Milton's portrayal of Lucifer is particularly nuanced, presenting him as a tragic figure whose pride and ambition lead to his downfall. This literary depiction encourages readers to consider the broader themes of free will, redemption, and the nature of evil, adding depth to the understanding of angels as characters capable of complex moral decisions. The interpretation of contemporary phenomena in the United States as signs of the end times is a topic that intertwines theology, sociology, and eschatology. Many people, particularly those within certain religious communities, view current events through the lens of biblical prophecy and eschatological expectations. This perspective often hinges on the belief that that specific occurrences and trends align with the predictions outlined in the Bible, particularly in books such as Daniel and Revelation. However, understanding this interpretation requires examining the various signs typically associated with the end times, the theological basis for such beliefs, and the socio-cultural context in which these interpretations arise. One of the primary reasons some people see recent events as signs of the end times is their alignment with the Bible, with biblical prophecies about natural disasters, societal upheaval, and moral decay. For instance, the increasing frequency and intensity of natural disasters such as hurricanes, wildfires, and earthquakes are often cited as fulfilling Jesus' words in Matthew 24, 7, where he speaks of famines and earthquakes in various places. Additionally, the global COVID-19 pandemic has led some to recall the plagues and pestilences mentioned in Luke 21, 11. These events are interpreted as precursors to the final judgment and the return of Christ, instilling a sense of urgency and anticipation among believers. Be Political and social instability is another key area where contemporary events are linked to end times prophecies. A polarization and division within American society, along with widespread protests and civil unrest, are seen by some as some as signs of the societal breakdown prophesied in St. Timothy 3. 1. 10. 5. This passage describes a time when people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, and lacking self-control. 
the moral and ethical dilemmas faced by modern society, including debates over issues like abortion, same-sex marriage, and gender identity, are interpreted by some as evidence of a departure from biblical values, further indicating a period of apostasy and moral decline anticipated in the end times. Economic turmoil and the emergence of global financial crises also play into the narrative of end-time signs. The uncertainty and volatility of the global economy, marked by recessions, stock market crashes and the widening gap between rich and poor, are reminiscent of the economic tribulations described 5 to 6, where the third seal is broken and a rider on a black horse appears, first representing famine and economic hardship. The dependence on digital currency and advancements in technology are sometimes linked to the mark of the beast mentioned in Revelation 13, 1 6, which describes a time when people will not be able to buy or sell without the mark, interpreted by some as a form of economic control and surveillance. Another aspect that fuels the belief in contemporary signs of the end times is the geopolitical landscape, particularly concerning the Middle East, is the ongoing conflict in the region. Tensions surrounding Israel and the peace accords between Israel and its neighbors are often viewed through the prophetic lens of biblical passages such as Ezekiel 38-39, which describe a great battle involving Israel in the end times. The establishment of the modern state of Israel in 1948 and its central role in global politics is frequently cited as a fulfillment of prophecy, reinforcing the belief that we are living in the last days. The advancements in technology and the rise of artificial intelligence also contribute to end-time speculation. The rapid development of AI, robotics, and biotechnology raises ethical and existential questions that some interpret as aligning with biblical warnings about the rise of knowledge and potential threats to humanity's autonomy and moral fabric. Daniel 12 4 speaks of a time when many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase which some see as indicative of our current era of technological advancement and information overload. While these interpretations hold significant sway among certain religious groups, it is essential to approach them with a critical and balanced perspective. B. The identification of contemporary events as signs of the end times is often influenced by subjective interpretation and the tendency to view events through a particular theological framework. Many scholars and theologians caution against drawing direct correlations between specific current events and biblical prophecies, emphasizing the importance of context and the symbolic nature of apocalyptic literature. Furthermore, it is worth noting that predictions about the end times have been a recurring theme throughout history. Various historical events, such as the fall of the Roman Empire, the Black Death, and the World Wars have been interpreted by contemporaries as signs of the impending apocalypse. Each era has faced its own challenges and uncertainties, leading people to see their times as uniquely significant in the prophetic timeline. The belief that contemporary phenomena in the United States are signs of the end times is a complex and multifaceted topic. Rooted in theological interpretation and sociocultural context, the, while many events and trends can be seen as aligning with biblical prophecies, it is crucial to approach such interpretations with caution and an awareness of the historical tendency to view one's own time as pivotal in the divine plan. Whether these events are truly signs of the end times or part of the ongoing challenges of human remains a matter of faith and perspective. The increasing frequency and intensity of natural disasters in the United States are a pressing concern that has captured the attention of scientists, policymakers, and the general public. Over the past few decades, the country has witnessed a significant rise in the occurrence and severity of events such as hurricanes, wildfires, floods, and heat waves. This trend is attributed to a complex interplay of factors, including climate change, urbanization, and environmental degradation. Understanding the underlying causes and implications of this phenomenon is crucial for developing effective strategies to mitigate its impacts and enhance resilience. Climate change is widely recognized as a major driver of the escalating frequency and intensity of natural disasters. 
The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has reported that global warming, primarily caused by human activities such as burning fossil fuels and deforestation, is leading to more extreme weather events. Rising global temperatures are increasing the energy available in the atmosphere, the which can intensify storms and precipitation. For instance, warmer ocean temperatures have been linked to more powerful hurricanes. The 2017 Atlantic hurricane season, which included devastating storms like Harvey, Irma, and Maria serves as a stark example of how climate change can amplify the destructive potential of hurricanes, resulting in unprecedented levels of rainfall, storm surges, and wind speeds. In addition to hurricanes, wildfires have become more frequent and severe in the United States, particularly in the western regions. Prolonged droughts, higher temperatures, and changing precipitation patterns have created ideal conditions for wildfires to ignite and spread rapidly. The state of California has experienced some of the most destructive wildfire seasons on record in recent years with fires like the Camp Fire in 2018 and the Dixie Fire in 2021 causing widespread devastation. These wildfires not only destroy homes and infrastructure, but also pose significant health risks due to the smoke and particulate matter they release into the atmosphere. The increasing prevalence of wildfires highlights the urgent need for comprehensive land management practices and robust firefighting resources. Flooding is another natural disaster that has become more common and severe across the United States. Heavy rainfall events exacerbated by climate change are leading to more frequent and intense flooding. The Midwest and Southeast regions have been particularly hard hit, with communities along major rivers like the Mississippi and Missouri experiencing recurrent floods. The 2019 floods in the Midwest, driven by a combination of heavy rainfall and rapid snow melt, resulted in significant agricultural losses and damage to infrastructure. Coastal areas are also facing increasing flood risks due to sea level rise and storm surges. Cities like Miami and New Orleans are grappling with the challenges of managing chronic flooding and protecting their populations from future inundation. And heat waves have also become more frequent and sever opposing significant risks to public health and safety. Extended periods of extreme heat can lead to heat-related illnesses and exacerbate existing health conditions, particularly among vulnerable populations such as the elderly, children, and those with pre-existing medical conditions. The summer of 2021 saw record-breaking heat waves across the Pacific Northwest, with temperatures soaring above 110 degrees Fahrenheit in cities like Portland and Seattle, regions unaccustomed to such extreme heat. The increased frequency of heat waves is a direct consequence of global warming and highlights the urgent need for adaptive measures, such as cooling centers and public health interventions to protect communities from the adverse effects of extreme heat. De Urbanization and environmental degradation are additional factors contributing to the increasing frequency and intensity. Rapid urban development often leads to the destruction of natural buffers, such as wetlands and forests which play a crucial role in mitigating the impacts of disasters like flooding and hurricanes. For example, the loss of wetlands along the Gulf Coast has reduced the natural absorption capacity for storm surges, making coastal communities more vulnerable to flooding. Similarly, deforestation and land use changes in the western United States have increased the risk of wildfires by altering the natural landscape and reducing moisture levels in vegetation. Urban areas also tend to create heat islands, where temperatures are significantly higher than in surrounding rural areas due to the concentration of buildings and infrastructure. Exacerbating the effects of heat waves, the economic and social impacts of the increasing frequency and intensity of natural disasters are profound. The financial costs of disaster response, recovery, and rebuilding are substantial, placing a significant burden on federal, state, and local governments. For example, the damages from Hurricane Harvey alone were estimated to exceed $125 billion, making it one of the costliest natural disasters in U.S. history. Beyond the immediate financial costs, natural disasters also disrupt livelihoods, displaced populations, and strain social services. The psychological toll on affected communities is considerable, with individuals experiencing trauma, anxiety, and a sense of loss.
Long-term recovery efforts often face challenges related to funding, coordination, and ensuring that vulnerable populations receive adequate support. Addressing the increasing frequency and intensity of natural disasters requires a multifaceted approach that encompasses mitigation, adaptation, and resilience building strategies. Mitigation efforts focus on reducing the underlying causes of climate change by transitioning to renewable energy sources, improving energy efficiency, and implementing policies that promote sustainable land use and conservation. For instance, reducing greenhouse gas emissions through the adoption of clean energy technologies and enhancing carbon sequestration through reforestation and soil management practices can help mitigate the effects of climate change. Adaptation strategies are crucial for managing the immediate and long-term impacts of natural disasters. And this includes investing in resilient infrastructure, such as flood defenses, seawalls, and fire breaks, as well as improving early warning systems and disaster preparedness plans, urban planning that incorporates green infrastructure, such as parks, green roofs, and permeable pavements, can help mitigate the impacts of heat waves and flooding. Building codes and land use regulations should also be updated to ensure that new developments are resilient to the anticipated impacts of climate change. Community resilience building is essential for enhancing the capacity of individuals and communities to withstand and recover from natural disasters. This involves fostering social cohesion, supporting local leadership, and ensuring that disaster response and recovery efforts are inclusive and equitable. Public education and awareness campaigns can empower communities with the knowledge and resources needed to prepare for and respond to disasters effectively. Collaboration between government agencies, nonprofit organizations, the private sector, and local communities is critical for developing and implementing comprehensive resilience strategies. The increasing frequency and intensity of natural disasters in the United States are a multifaceted issue driven by climate change, urbanization, and environmental degradation. Addressing this challenge requires a holistic approach that includes mitigation, adaptation, and resilience building efforts. By understanding the underlying causes and investing in proactive measures, society can better protect vulnerable populations, reduce economic losses, and enhance the overall resilience of communities in the face of an uncertain future. The urgency of this issue cannot be overstated, as the impacts of natural disasters are likely to intensify in the coming decades, necessitating concerted and sustained action at all levels of society. The appearance of angels in the sky as a sign of the end times is a topic that has captivated the imagination and faith of many believers throughout history. This phenomenon is often linked to biblical prophecies and apocalyptic literature, which describe celestial beings heralding significant eschatological events. In both the Old and New Testaments, angels are depicted as messengers of God often appearing at pivotal moments to deliver divine revelations, execute judgment, or provide guidance. The belief that angelic manifestations in the sky are harbingers of the end times is rooted in these scriptural traditions and has been reinforced by various theological interpretations and cultural narratives over the centuries. In the Bible, angels are frequently associated with momentous events that signal God's direct intervention in human affairs. For instance, in the book of Daniel, the angel Gabriel appears to Daniel to explain visions concerning the end times and the establishment of God's kingdom, Daniel 8 to 12. Similarly, in the New Testament, angels play a crucial role in the announcement of Jesus' birth, his resurrection, and his eventual return. The angelic proclamation of Jesus' birth to the shepherds, Luke 2, 8-14, and the angels present at his ascension, Acts 110-11, underscore their role as messengers of divine revelation. These biblical accounts have shaped the expectation that angels will again appear in the sky to announce the culmination of history and the fulfillment of God's ultimate plan. The book of Revelation in particular is rich with angelic imagery associated with the end times. John's apocalyptic vision includes numerous references to angels executing God's judgments, sounding trumpets and delivering messages to humanity. Revelation 14, 6, 7 describes an angel flying in mid-air with the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth. Transcripts provided by Transcription Outsourcing, LLC 
This passage and others like it reinforce the idea that angels will play a prominent role in the eschatological events leading up to the final judgment and the establishment of a new heaven and new earth. Throughout history, various religious movements and individuals have have claimed to witness angelic appearances, interpreting these sightings as signs of impending eschatological events. These claims often gain significant attention and contribute to a heightened sense of anticipation and urgency among believers. For example, during times of social upheaval, natural disasters, or global crises, reports of angelic sightings tend to increase as people seek reassurance and meaning in the face of uncertainty. And these reports are often interpreted as divine signs, affirming the belief that the world is approaching a climactic and transformative moment in God's plan. One notable instance of such a phenomenon is the series of apparitions reported by three shepherd children in Fatima, Portugal, in 1917. According to their accounts, an angel appeared to them on several occasions, preparing them for subsequent visions of the Virgin Mary. The messages conveyed during these apparitions included calls for repentance and prayer, as well as prophecies concerning future events. While not directly described as an end times event, the Fatima apparitions have been interpreted by some as part of a broader divine warning about the state of the world and the need for spiritual renewal. In contemporary times, reports of angelic sightings and other supernatural phenomena continue to capture the public's imagination. The advent of social media and the internet has facilitated the rapid spread of such stories, often accompanied by photos and videos purportedly showing angels in the sky. The, these modern accounts are frequently shared within religious communities and sometimes go viral, reinforcing the belief in angelic intervention and the imminence of the end times. A, skeptics may attribute these sightings to natural phenomena, optical illusions, or digital manipulation. But for many believers, they serve as powerful reminders of the spiritual dimensions of life and the unfolding of divine prophecy. The interpretation of angelic appearances as signs of the end times is also influenced by theological frameworks and eschatological doctrines within various Christian traditions. Dispensationalism, for example, is a theological system that emphasizes the literal interpretation of biblical prophecies and the distinct periods or dispensations in God's plan for humanity. Within this framework, the appearance of angels in the sky could be seen as a literal fulfillment of scriptural prophecies marking the transition to the final dispensation and the return of Christ. This perspective often includes a detailed timeline of events, such as the rapture, tribulation, and millennium, with angelic activity playing a significant role in these eschatological milestones. Moreover, the symbolism of angels in the sky resonates deeply with the human psyche, invoking a sense of awe and transcendence. Angels as celestial beings represent a connection between the divine and the earthly embodying the hope of divine intervention and the ultimate triumph of good over evil. Their appearance in the sky, a realm traditionally associated with the divine, amplifies this symbolism, suggesting that the heavens themselves are bearing witness to God's unfolding plan. This powerful imagery reinforces the anticipation of the end times, encouraging believers to remain vigilant and faithful in their spiritual journey. It is also important to consider the psychological and socio-cultural dimensions of interpreting angelic appearances as end-time signs, 